So we, we are coming now to the last, but definitely not the least of the panels of today. Uh, today is the uh, first day of our conference. We are concluding with uh, a major area of uh, maritime activity, the uh, Jones Act uh, area. And I'm delighted to have with us uh, such a distinguished panel, really having uh, all major uh, industry participants. And uh, I'd like to thank them all for being with us. I'd like also to thank Ben, uh, who is the analyst covering the sector, and of course, John Imhoff, who is uh, going to moderate it and uh, who helped us to put it together. So thank you to all of you, and uh, without any more delay, John, please take over. Yep. Welcome to the Jones Act Roundtable. My name is John Imhoff. I'm a lawyer and shareholder at Better Price here in New York and a member of its Global Transportation Finance Group. Uh, Vetter is a law firm based in Chicago with offices in New York, Washington, D.C., London, San Francisco, Los Angeles, and Singapore. And our maritime group is primarily focused in New York, uh, London, and Singapore. Uh, I've been practicing in the area of transportation finance for more than 30 years and for almost the last 20 years in maritime finance, much of that time uh, working in transactions involving the Jones Act. We'll be discussing recent developments in the Jones Act sector uh, and where those sectors are going. And those sectors will include the transportation of crude and petroleum products, dry bulk uh, like coal and aggregates, containers and motor vehicles, and the provision of services such as offshore supply, construction and dredging support. Um, so your first question may be, uh, uh, what is the Jones Act? Most of the delegates here in the US probably know about it. Uh, but since for the first time this forum is being uh, webcast worldwide, including to delegates outside of the US who may not have heard about the Jones Act, let me give you a quick summary. We could spend the entire day delving into the legal, political, and economic uh, intricacies of the act, but I thought it'd be helpful to summarize some of the provisions to give you context for the discussion. The Jones Act is a body of US cabotage laws restricting the transportation of merchandise by water between points in the US to certain vessels. The core provision became law as part of the Merchant Marine Act of 1920 following World War I. So the law is almost you know, just about 100 years old. With, it provides that with certain exceptions, the transportation of merchandise between points in the U.S. is restricted to vessels that are owned by citizens in the U.S., uh, built in the United States and documented under U.S. flag, one of the consequences of which is that it must be crewed by citizens of the U.S. Over the years, the Jones Act has been amended to create special exemptions and rules um, uh, as to how it's applied. And there's a great body of dispute, or not dispute, but a great body of interpretation regarding what constitutes merchandise, what constitutes a point in the United States, and what a citizen is. Um, the policy behind uh, the Jones Act is, is enforced by the United States Custom and Border Protection with assistance from MARAD, the United States Marine uh, Maritime Administration and the United States Coast Guard. The policy behind the Jones Act, for those who aren't familiar with it, is really the promotion of national defense by supporting U.S. shipyards since Jones Act vessels must be built in the U.S. Uh, so that if needed, they can produce warships and supply vessels in times of conflict and help maintain a pool of U.S. skilled ship workers, uh, shipyard workers to build those vessels and a pool of skilled U.S. merchant mariners to operate them. There are similar laws uh, applying to the transportation of passengers, such as cruise ships, vessel escort, towing, dredging, and commercial fishing. Um, let me first introduce the panelists here who will discuss the, the market in, for the Jones Act. The Jones Act has multiple sectors, as I mentioned earlier. Uh, and as I, as I introduce each, each panelist, we'll go alphabetically, I'd, I'd ask that they tell us a little bit about what they do and if they're uh, uh, an executive at one of the at a company, Jones Act company, that you described for us the sectors in which they're involved and tell us a little bit more about the company. Uh, the first panelist is David Grzybinski. He's president's chief executive officer of Kirby Corporation. David, can you tell us a little bit about yourself and the company? Yeah, yeah. hi. Uh, th thanks for having uh, Kirby participate in this panel. Really appreciate it. Uh, yeah, Kirby is a uh, public company uh, listed on the New York Stock Exchange. Um, we are in, in two main businesses, one marine transportation of liquids around the United States uh, using barges and tugboats and towboats. And um, we're also in the 
distribution and services business around diesel engines and transmissions throughout the industrial parts of the United States. Um, in our marine business, we have uh, approximately uh, 1,200 barges, and we use about 350 towboats and tugboats to move the barges around the United States. Uh, we're, we're principally liquid. We do do some dry cargo, but 99% uh, of what we move is liquid, and that includes petrochemicals, crude oil, refined products such as gasoline, diesel, and jet fuel. Um, that's Kirby in a nutshell. Okay, uh, Ben, uh, you're, you're not the CEO of a Jones Act company, but you know quite a bit about it as head of maritime research. Tell us a little bit about what you do and what you follow. Sure. So um, I do, I, I guess I hold the uh, distinction uh, of being the analyst that covers the most Jones Act companies, uh, as far as I know, um, but uh, cover shipping more broadly. Um, obviously, both Jones Act and International, as well as some energy infrastructure um, uh, type companies. And uh, gosh, I guess I've been covering the space since 2005. So, uh, you know, uh, certainly have uh, learned a little, not as much as some of these guys, but, but a little over the, over the years. <laughs> uh, Sam, uh, Sam Norton is president and CEO of Overseas Shipbuilding Group, or OSG, as it's more commonly described. Sam, tell us a little bit about yourself and OSG, please. Thank you, John, and uh, thanks to Capital Link for organizing this forum. Appreciate the opportunity to, to attend and listen to my distinguished colleagues in the industry and field questions from your delegates. Um, OSG is uh, a sort of long story company in the United States, founded in the 1940s, uh, was one of the first publicly listed shipping companies uh, listing in the late 60s, uh, has gone through a number of iterations of what it actually has been, uh, always involved in shipping, but across many sectors. Uh, in 2016, the company split off its international shipping division uh, uh, to become a separately listed company and left behind what is essentially a Jones Act focused business. Uh, today, 24 vessels that are operating in the transportation of crude oil and refined petroleum products, uh, not in the river sectors as Kirby is, but uh, principally along the coastal areas in the United States. Our principal business is moving transportation fuel from the production areas in um, <clears throat> what's known as Pad 3, that's Texas, Louisiana, uh, where the refineries are located into the main consuming market in Florida. Florida is unique along the East Coast of the United States in that it has neither a refining base nor is supported by pipelines. Uh, therefore, all of the transportation fuel that moves into the, into the state of Florida uh, comes by sea. We're also active in the West Coast in distributing petroleum products along the West Coast states from the refining centers in, there, in, those, in that geographic area. And, uh, and we are, uh, as of March, uh, uh, owning and operating uh, crude oil tankers that bring crude oil from uh, the state of Alaska into the West Coast refineries uh, on the West Coast. Uh, we're a publicly listed company listed on the New York Stock Exchange. And um, I'll turn it back to you, John. Okay, thank, uh, thank you, Sam. Appreciate it. Um, uh, the next, uh, Dan Thorogood is uh, President and Chief Executive Officer of Seabulk and Vice President at Seacor. Um, Dan, can you tell us a little bit about Seabulk and Seacor and what activities they're engaged in in the Jones Act space? Yeah, hi, John. Um, pleased to be here and um, representing on behalf of the Seacor group. Um, Seacor is a public company and uh, is a diversified maritime transportation and logistics platform. Uh, it's been around since 1989, uh, currently has two main divisions, one servicing uh, dry cargo on the Atlantic River system and the other serving uh, ocean and coastal transportation uh, in the U.S. Jones Act and harbor towing uh, support in various ports along the US Gulf Coast and Florida Coast. My responsibility is uh, for uh, the US uh, uh, Ocean Group, the, the coastal group, and that comes under the Seabulk uh, brand. 
Thank you, Dan. To another Dan, uh, Dan Warner is Senior Vice President and Treasurer of Crowley Corporation, which in contrast to the other companies represented here is a private company. Uh, Dan, tell us a little bit about Crowley and its involvement in the Jones Act space. Certainly. Thanks, John, and, and welcome to all. It's nice to connect with everyone, uh, albeit virtually and not in person at uh, the, these conferences that are held with a fair amount of regularity. Um, Crowley Maritime is a company that was founded in San Francisco back in 1892, so that gives us about 128 years of continuous operation. Uh, we're currently headquartered in Florida, uh, in Jacksonville, and enjoying our third generation of ownership and, and leadership under the, uh, under the Crowley family, and Tom Crowley is the, is the principal owner and CEO of the corporation. Uh, we're privately held, as you mentioned, uh, we're actually an S corporation for tax purposes, diversified service offering in transportation and logistics services uh, with a traditional maritime base. Um, approximately 50% of our earnings, I would say, are, are related to Jones Act uh, uh, activities. Uh, our sectors would uh, be categorized as, as petroleum transportation uh, through tankers and, and articulated tug barges, uh, container shipping to Puerto Rico, um, the ship assist and escort work primarily on the West Coast, um, and then we have uh, a dedicated fleet of heavy lift barges and dynamic positioning tugs that aren't exactly in the offshore space, but tangentially related. Uh, and those are really our main uh, Jones Act activities. Uh, other assets for the corporation, uh, terminals, warehouses, specialty equipment, uh, obviously container equipment uh, in terms of size. Uh, they've got about 6,000 employees worldwide and you know, the size of the company do about uh, two and a half billion in, in sales. Balance sheet's about the same. And as a private company, that's all the financial disclosure I'm gonna offer. So thank you. Thank you, Dan. Um, uh, I'll, I'll use uh, your last names to distinguish you, you from Dan Thurgood. We have two Dans on the panel. Um, finally, uh, let me introduce Mr. Joel Winnie, the Chief Executive or Chief Financial Officer at Matson. It's a slightly different company. Joel, what can you tell us about Matson in the Jones Act space? Thank you, John, and uh, thanks Capital Inc. for inviting us to be on the panel. So Matson is also an old company similar to Crowley. We're a 138 year old company. Uh, mm -hmm. Two main segments, one, ocean transportation, which is about a $2 billion revenue business focused on container shipping all in the Pacific. So our big Jones Act markets are Hawaii, Alaska, and Guam. We also participate significantly in the China to the U.S. trade, as well as South Pacific trades in New Zealand, Samoa, and other South Pacific islands. And in the case of Hawaii, we've been delivering freight to Hawaii since our founding in 1882. Our other main segment is logistics. We're about a $500 million logistics business focused on freight forwarding, transportation brokerage, which is intermodal and trucking brokerage, and also warehousing and supply chain management. Uh, and Matson itself is a publicly traded company as well on the, Mats on the uh, New York Stock Exchange. Thank you, Joel. Well, let's start off with um, the state of the Jones Act market today. And what I would uh, first propose to do is maybe get a general overview and then look at drill down on each individual sector and how they fared over the past year, what the biggest market factors are influencing the sector the effects of COVID-19 and the economic downturn on your business and, and how your companies have had to adapt, uh, what initiatives you may have taken in the environmental, social, and corporate governance area, or ESG, uh, and what other developments over the past years have happened with your company. Uh, but first, let me turn it over to Ben to sort of give a general, his general view of the Jones Act market as, as, it, as it exists today. Uh, ben, what can you tell us? Sure. So, you know, I, I I mean, it feels awkward talking about a market when there's all these other experts in their own fields. Although I do think one of the things that uh, brings it all together is that they are so diverse uh, that it's an eclectic group of businesses that really only have a legislation um, or, or a, in, in common. Um, and as a function of that, I think as we're looking or as I look at uh, Jones Act companies or businesses within the Jones Act, um, their relative performance and strength sort of varies depending on where they are at the moment. Um, as you might expect, anything that is a little bit more 
oil and gas related is a little bit more challenging. Um, and, and probably the closer to the drill bit you are, the more challenging it is. Um, conversely, um, and, and I'm sure that Joel can speak to this, the US consumer is humming right now. And so if you are, you know, maybe, maybe a little bit more on the consumer side, um, then your business is doing very good. And that, that would probably also be true of, uh, of assist vessels and, and things that uh, um, connect, um, let's say consumers to the, um, the broader economy. So I don't know that, <clears throat> I don't know that it's fair right now to paint all Jones Act businesses with the same brush, and maybe it never is uh, fair to do that. I do think that in general, that the Jones Act market is uh, not an area where usually you would think of it as uh, high growth. Um, it's it's more sort of people playing in their lanes, but there's a high barrier to entry generally. And, and so that is an advantage that the Jones Act has relative to the broader shipping universe. And um, uh, yeah, and, and that doesn't remove cyclicality, but uh, it, it all that, that same competitive advantage can sometimes also make a little bit uh, or create an impediment to growth. Um, but um, I, that's that's sort of where I think we're at. It, it the answer is mixed. Um, so some things are doing well, some things are not doing quite as well. Okay, thank you, Ben. Um, why don't we first turn to uh, the tankers uh, sector that slice of the Jones Act, and that can re really be divided into um, uh, inland uh, shipments, inland waterways, the movement of petroleum and petroleum products on the inland waterways and rivers, uh, and the coastal type activity. David is, uh, your uh, Kirby is much more of an inland company. Um, Sam, for example, at OSG is more coastal. Um, let me start with you, David, since, since this is your, one of your uh, main sectors. Tell us a little bit about what's going on in the tanker section. Yeah, so when you look at Kirby's marine revenue, about 70% of it is inland based. Uh, and then a, another 30% is, is close wise or blue water. Um, inland, really, we, we transit the, the Mississippi River and all her tributaries, which include the Illinois, the Ohio, et cetera. Um, and also, we're, we're blessed with an intercoastal waterway that goes essentially from, from Mexico all the way around to Florida. And it's a protected canal where we can, we can have inland barges uh, transit. Uh, when, you, when you look at what we move, we, we move it, uh, you know, we can move cargo all the way from Pittsburgh, for example, down to Mexico on an inland barge, which is, uh, uh, you know, the US is blessed to have such an inland waterway. Um, when we look at what's going on in the market right now, um, as Ben um, indicated, uh, you know, COVID and anything oil related is down. The demand is down. It, you, you can just look at us doing this remote con conference now. Uh, the, you know, there's a lot of plane tickets that weren't purchased uh, for this conference. And um, so demand has fallen off, particularly for jet fuel. Um, but refined products in general, so diesel, gasoline, and jet fuel have come, come down considerably uh, b because of COVID. Uh, you can look at refinery utilization if you, if you track those, those companies and you can see that, uh, you know, pre-COVID uh, refinery utilization was essentially in the, the, the low 90% area. I think during COVID, uh, the worst point, it got down to 67, 68, 69%. It bounced back uh, up to about 80 at, at one point, and now it's about 75, 76%. So um, that's the refiners cutting back uh, because the demand's just not there. So uh, on the inland barge side, we we felt that. I mean, that's been demand uh, moves that we, we just don't have now. Uh, I would say conversely, petrochemicals have have rebounded, not quite to their full extent uh, in uh, pre-COVID level, but uh, the demand for petrochemicals is has come back uh, better than than refined products. So, you know, just to put it in terms of chemical plant utilization, I think uh, chemical plants were running in the high 70% range, and now they're kind of in the low 70% uh, range. So. You know, maybe five, ten percent off at the at the most in terms of what they were doing versus 
uh, something larger in the refined products. Uh, the, the good news, I think, is that there's a lot of new chemical facilities in the United States, and these are the most efficient chemical plants in the, in the world now because they're brand new. They've got cheap, uh, cheap feedstocks. Uh, so, you know, in the long run, the, the, the demand will come back uh, because this is the place where they can manufacture the, the chemicals uh, uh, very efficiently. Um, so that's just a broad overview, uh, John. Thank you. <laughs> Appreciate it, David. Um, Sam, how about in the coastal and ocean-going uh, arena for tankers, Jones Act tankers? Is it are you observing the same kind of, um, of drop in demand and, and uh, gradual recovery, or has it been different uh, for, for uh, OSG? So uh, I'll kind of take that at, at a couple of levels. Uh, the, the, the blue water marine sector um, in, for transportation fuels in the United States uh, entered 2020 in a, in a very strong position. The market was, uh, was quite tight, uh, demand and supply wise. Um, and uh, entering the first quarter of this year, in fact, the entire Jones Act blue water fleet was time chartered out. Um, so the, the net effect of that was over the last several quarters, uh, the impact of the demand destruction that David referred to and, and the other uh, secondary aspects of COVID uh, have not really directly affected the Jones Act operators in the, in the, in the Blue Water fleet. And that includes Crowley and Secor and ourselves and, um, uh, and Kinder Morgan, who is not uh, presenting today. Um, that, uh, you know, that time charter uh, book, if you will, uh, will begin to roll off as we move through uh, the latter part of this year and into next year. And so some of the utilization or disutilization of those assets that arose from, uh, from the demand destruction that occurred during COVID, it'll start to be transferred back to the owners as opposed to the, to the end users directly. Um, you know, I, I'd, like to, I'd like to sort of piggyback off David's comments about demand uh, being destroyed by COVID and, uh, and the high level of confidence that demand will come back uh, by, by, by uh, painting a picture that international shipping, which many of the panelists or many of the, the, the uh, members that are participating in this, uh, of this forum are, are more familiar with, um, more often, the cyclicality of the industry is driven by supply rather than demand disruption. Uh, international market uh, supply comes lumpy. Uh, it it you know it comes in in, in waves and uh, tends to be uh, you know counter cyclically timed with movements in the economy, which leaves large swaths of the fleet uh, of oversupply waiting for demand to come back. Uh, the Jones Act is is not really that way at all. Uh, if you look at the deep water uh, sector, uh, there are no vessels on order currently other than one barge, uh, which is to be delivered in, uh, in December of this year. That's our barge. Uh, there are no tankers on order, nor in fact, if you wanted to order any tankers, could one be delivered for many years. Uh, in a similar way, the barge building capacity is relatively constrained with many of the domestic shipyards uh, having their capacity taken up with doing work for the government at the moment. Um, so the, the supply situation is very, is very stable. In fact, it's in the blue water is probably slightly declining as some of the older assets continue to be aged out. Um, and therefore it's really a function of demand. And, um, you know, when we look around uh, at the, the trajectory of the demand recovery in the United States, everybody has a big question mark. Uh, how much stimulus will be passed in the government? What's the consumer behavior, how quickly can a vaccine come back? How quickly will people be joining uh, airlines and airplanes uh, to take us from where we are today? Uh, all of that is, is relatively unknown, but uh, I think the, the fundamental belief of everyone that's involved in these sectors is that uh, it's not a question of if, it's a question of when, uh, how long will it take? Uh, it's not likely to be a sustained period. Uh, there's quite a bit of cause for optimism that uh, what what everyone characterizes normalized behavior could could come back within a year uh, or so, uh, and therefore um, the the sort of medium term outlook for this sector is very positive. As I said, underlined by the the fact that the the, the supply demand balance is very tight, and as long as that demand comes back at levels that were consistent with what we saw at the beginning of this year, uh, the market should be quite strong. Okay. Um 
let, let me let me toss it over to um, Dan Warner at uh, at Crowley. Um, are you do you concur with the uh, with Sam's assessment? Yes, I, I don't I don't have a lot of disagreement with the, the comments that have been made. Um, I, I think uh, you know in terms of you know Crowley's experience uh, for the last year or so. Again, everything's been under, the fleet's been under under time charter, so utilization has been high. Uh, as Sam points out, uh, some of those vessels are coming up for renewal, and we'll we'll see what the market will bear. Um, I, I think the uncertainty around demand is, is certainly going to drive uh, those pricing dynamics. Uh, we're not overly concerned that there'll be a, a dramatic drop in utilization of the fleet, but I think current charter uh, terms and commitments will, will shorten up and, and, and frankly, there may be some softening of the rates. Uh, so we'll have to see what, what, what emerges here. But uh, you know, by and large, I think that's correct. Um, we are watching it and the demand uncertainty and the destruction that uh, you know, we've seen on that front, uh, I think is consistent with the remarks made by, by Kirby and OSG. Uh, you know, our numbers are saying the same thing. About 20% of the, the refining capacity has been idled uh, for the U.S., and obviously that's had an effect on, on pricing. So um, it's been a good run so far, uh, but I think we are going into a little bit of an uncert un un uncertain uh, territory here, and we'll uh, have to see what emerges as we go through our renewal process. Any any thoughts from uh, uh, from Seabolt, Dan uh, Thorogood? And, and two-part question, um, you know, Tell us a little bit about, about the ESG initiatives you've been undertaking at uh, Seabulk, including your carbon offset initiative. Uh, sure, John. Before I get to that, I think uh, the other speakers covered uh, the Jones Act tank vessel uh, blue water um, status well. But just sort of looking through COVID, um, because it takes up a lot of our attention, I, I think as you come out of that, uh, to reiterate Sam's point, you have a very stable uh, fleet from a supply side. Uh, demand is always very hard to predict, but there clearly are <coughs> elements of um, uh, sort of future growth, albeit incremental around petrochemicals. And um, <coughs> sitting here in Florida, where we're headquartered, uh, and providing the harbor towing services, um, uh, we've seen uh, the rebound in activity uh, for ships calling with uh, finished products into Florida. Uh, creeping back up from the lows in May and June. Uh, and we think, you know, as we come out of this, <clears throat> uh, key demand centers like Florida will, will remain will remain very, very healthy as, as you actually see a declining supply of available vessels to service it. Um, to segue in, into the uh, ESG question, um, we uh, have uh, undertaken an experiment in 2020 uh, in our Seabolt Towing Group, which is a harbor towing provider along the Gulf Coast and Florida ports. And uh, we effectively uh, uh, purchased carbon offsets and retired them, uh, thereby creating a carbon neutral footprint for every uh, docking uh, job we undertake this year. And we have obviously marketed that hard to our charterers. Um, <clears throat> some have responded very, very well. BP and Shell have been um, uh, uh, very pleased with, with the approach. Um, uh, others uh, yet to see the value, uh, but we didn't do it to uh, claim we're, we're uh, now um, you know, carbon neutral forever. We have more work to do on that, and it's something that I think the industry uh, is a challenge and an opportunity for the Jones Act industry going forward, but we did it to really test uh, how our customers felt about it, and you will have seen some recent press releases from um, the, Mar the Global Maritime Forum and the Sea Cargo Charter. There's definitely a trend emerging where um, folks in our space need to start to think about decarbonizing. Um, and uh, these are opportunities to invest and change uh, the trajectory in the Jones Act. And, and actually, for Joel and, and others in the container shipping lines, there's been a lot of leadership, uh, Crowley. Uh, on uh, getting to lower carbon solutions, uh, uh, really leadership across uh, ahead of some of the international folks too. So, I'll hand it back. We'll to come you. to uh, to uh, Matson in a second because I'm familiar with their LNG new build vessels. Um, came out with a real splash <laughs> uh, a couple of years ago, I think. But we'll come back to uh, containers in a minute. But let me switch quickly to to dry bulk. I think Dan Thorogood at Secor, that's your 
your area, um, uh, tell us a little bit about dry bulk. When I think dry bulk, uh, I think primarily inland and coal. Um, what what effect have you seen uh, uh, from COVID and the availability of cheap natural gas? Has that been uh, damp, put a dampening effect on, on dry bulk uh, transportation of coal? So John, I'm going to dodge the question a little bit because I'm not um, as close to the inland river barge market, which is the other key segment at Seacore, but we do run dry cargo ships in the blue water uh, side and um, our view is that's a sort of a tail of an industry with coal uh, clearly uh, disappearing. Uh, there is a fairly robust fertilizer and phosphate rock movement that goes between Tampa and the Mississippi River uh, that may over time uh, need uh, assets to be uh, either repurposed or, or, or new builds, but it is a limited space um, and it's not an area we, uh, we would expect to spend a whole lot of time on going forward. David, how about, what do you think at uh, Kirby? Yeah, we, we don't have much dry bulk. We, we, uh, our dry bulk is really offshore. We do, we do, we have two, two barges that take coal from New Orleans area over to the Tampa area. And then we move sugar up the East coast. Uh, so we're, we, you know, that we haven't seen a lot of impact there. I mean, obviously, you know, what's going on in the coal market and the move to natural gas, but uh, we only have two, two barges there. Um, what I hear on, in terms of dry cargo on the inland side, on the inland water side, is it's, been, it's held up pretty good. I mean, most of it's grain and foodstuffs, and, and I, I think that's done okay. Aggregates, probably okay. It, 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 it would be things like coal that would be down, but I don't think that's a new trend. And I don't think it's at all related to COVID. Um, okay. Um, anybody else have any thoughts about dry bulk? Uh, ben, uh, did, did you want to add something? No, I, I agree with David. I mean, you can you can go look at the at the barge rates, the hopper barge rates, and um, you know, especially in September, they surged pretty well um, on the back of a pretty good harvest. So, um, uh, but but again, I. I would tend to agree with David. I, I think it's, um, if, it, if there's anything that's been sort of uh, unimpacted by COVID, it's probably that, that particular business. Okay. Anyone else have anything to say uh, before I turn to containers? <laughs> containers. Um, uh, let me start with Joel at Matson. Um, you, you have a very specific kind of uh, container trade in the Pacific, um, which is of course, it's Jones Act, uh, so it's from U.S. point to U.S. point. But I'm wondering if you've seen any changes in um, over the year, past couple of years, as a result of international trade tensions and uh, any knock-on effect on the Jones Act trade in containers. So um, on the Jones Act business, they know. So the the. The, what we're driven by in our Jones Act trades on the container side is the under, underlying demand from consumers primarily in Hawaii, Guam, and Alaska. So as those economies go, as those consumers um, have discretionary income to spend money on products that you buy in a store, that's what drives our containerized freight to those markets. Um, we do participate though in the international market from China to the United States, and that piece uh, was impacted from the trade relations with the United States and China and the tariffs over the last couple of years. But I would say uh, that was more of a 2018, 2019 phenomenon in terms of what products uh, and what tiering was in, impacted at ver for various types of products on the tariff negotiations and between the two countries. And that has all changed dramatically uh, with COVID. So since March, the US consumers um, obviously hunkered down very dramatically in the second quarter but we're seeing an uptick now in that trade because the U.S. consumer is now um, spending more and has less money being spent on um, uh, travel, um, entertainment, going to movies, going to restaurants, and spending more money uh, in some instances on consumable items that you get delivered to your door on e-commerce. And a lot of those products do originate in China. So we've seen a big uptick in e-commerce uh, demand out of China to the United States especially um, from midsummer to today. But I'd say on the Jones Act side, the Jones Act side has, has never really been impacted by the China okay. US trade relations. No, no real knock on effect. Um, right. Uh, 
let me ask you this question because I alluded to it a little bit earlier. You've been quite active in um, uh, you know, green emissions or lower carbon emissions. Uh, a number of your container vessels, uh, recent, recently delivered container vessels are LNG powered. What can you tell us about that? It's a very exciting development for us. So we've, we've spent um, $1 billion on a four ship new order program, two ships built in Philly shipyard in Philadelphia and two ships uh, in NASCO. Three of those four have been delivered and the last one is scheduled to be delivered here in the fourth quarter. And those four new Jones Act ships will replace the capacity of previously six ships prior. So the net of all of that is that we'll be burning a lot less fuel to be delivering the same amount of freight. So that's very, very good from an overall fuel consumption perspective. Those ships, all four of the ships are dual fuel, meaning they can burn uh, regular fuel oil, but they also have the capability in the engines, the capability to burn LNG. And so we're actively watching uh, the LNG availability markets on the West Coast ports that we operate in. So when LNG becomes available and it makes sense, we can, we can install the final um, tanks and piping system so those those ships could run LNG in the future. Okay, very good. Um, uh, Dan uh, Thorogood at Secor, you, you have containers as well. I mean, have, have um, and Ben alluded to, to this a little bit earlier that the international container trade has is, is, is really risen up and gotten some strength. Are you seeing the same in the, in the Jones Act trade? So um, Secor is the majority shareholder of Trailer Bridge, which is a row row and container liner service that operates uh, two scheduled weekly sailings between Jacksonville, Florida and San Juan, Puerto Rico. And um, we have seen uh, a similar um, kind of consumer rebound, as Joel alluded to, uh, in the Puerto Rico trade lane in the last eight <clears throat> to ten weeks um, through the early part of the lockdown and Puerto Rico had a fairly significant lockdown <clears throat> we um, we did see uh, a significant reduction in cargo but volumes uh, have come back very strong and uh, we are at full capacity servicing that trade lane right now well, there are a number of other sectors that um, are only sort of tangentially represented by this panel, uh, but let me give you all an opportunity to speak to it and maybe Ben, you wanna give us your views as well. You know, the, the Jones Act includes, um, you know, heavy lift and specialty uh, vessels. Um, I think Dan Warner at Crowley, uh, Crowley has some heavy lift vessels. Offshore, where I know Dan Crowley provides assistance in the offshore sector, but there are really no true offshore companies who are operating um, PSVs and um, AHTs in the, in the, in the Gulf uh, represented here. Uh, and there's also dredging and construction, and believe it or not, crews, I mean, they're, they're, they're cruise ships on the on river lines um, and cruise ships on the coast. Uh, we don't really have anybody here representing crews, but everyone knows it's it's probably suffering uh, as a result of COVID. Does anybody want to offer any any views on any of those sectors before we switch uh, gears and go into financing? Uh, maybe just a quick comment on the offshore space um, to the extent that we're tangentially involved. So Crowley has a fleet of uh, ten heavy lift barges, four by one hundred approximate in dimension. Um, and four uh, dynamic high, high spec uh, DP2 tugs that were designed to support offshore uh, work for oil uh, in the ENP space in the Gulf of Mexico. Um, so that was a wonderful idea about 10 years ago, which subsequently um, dried up once uh, oil prices um, corrected and, and declined. So it's interesting when you talk about offshore and the Jones Act, it is going through an evolution, we feel, uh, moving away from oil production and, and moving towards more renewable sources of energy. Uh, in particular, uh, the concept of wind farm installation um, and the future that that may hold, uh, I think is particularly topical. Uh, there's a lot of hurdles um, and decision points uh, 
along with uh, developing that sector, uh, not to mention uh, our, our upcoming elections, of course. Uh, but that's something that I think uh, is going to be important for, for operators in the Jones Act space with these types of capabilities um, and, and try to uh, really evolve that and, and move towards cleaner energy sources and, and modernize uh, the way we utilize and, and, and uh, drive energy for the, for the, for the country. Um, obviously, Europe's well ahead of us. Uh, and I think using their technologies, partnering with uh, companies uh, that have more advanced offshore um, wind farm installation and maintenance capabilities is going to be important. Uh, the assets, of course, are very expensive um, and involvement and support from um, large power generators uh, and companies that can uh, help put the bill uh, will also be important. And of course, I think there's a role for, for private equity uh, to step in as well. So um, that's a little bit of a, a long discourse, but I, I feel the offshore space is still important. It's just going through a, a bit of a metamorphosis from, from oil into new sources of energy. Let, let me switch to quickly to financing because I think we're running a little bit behind. I'm gonna ask this a, sort of a big, big picture question and throw it out to the panel to see what they uh, think about it. Um, have, have you been finding capital uh, readily available for investment? Is it equity? Is it is it debt? Uh, and what level of interest in the Jones Act is there among finance providers on the equity and debt side? Uh, uh, ben, maybe you can talk a, bit, a little bit about the equity. Sure. So, uh, I, I think um, that in general, Jones Act investors are different than probably most other shipping investors in that they tend to be more um, more long only, generally speaking, um, and uh, longer term value oriented or, or growth at a reasonable price uh, oriented investors who tend to be a little bit more uh, maybe industrials focused or um, or maybe transportation focused, but, um, but, but not necessarily the same the same group um, in most situations. And I, I think the reason for that is generally speaking, Jones Act shipping companies are, uh, have a deeper moat uh, and the cyclicality is not as great as it is in, in other shipping categories. And while it's hard, as I mentioned earlier, to get comfortable with uh, sort of a, a real pathway to long-term growth, um, there, there are many very smart, dedicated investors who sort of uh, play uh, play the the stocks from a from a value perspective, and I think that has not changed at all. Uh, I think um, the Jones Act, uh, from an equity perspective, uh, at least in the United States, which is a a big caveat um, in, in the United States, I think Jones Act shipping companies um, should and do have better access to equity capital. Um, than uh, international shipping companies, for instance. Um, but uh, uh, I'll let the others talk to you know their views and and, and perhaps uh, debt financing and so forth. Does anyone else want to contribute to that? To Ben's answer. Um, I have heard from investors that uh, on the, looking to provide debt financing that the Jones Act companies are often the a little bit more thinly capitalized with equity than other companies. Does anybody have any thoughts as to that? It seems to be a bit of a, a sticking point for some lenders to the space. Is that not true? John, it's Joel. I'll, I'll jump on that. I think it's not true across the board. I think Ben's comments were, were spot on. You know, it, in, investors um, are seeking returns and they, and they evaluate returns based upon risks. And one of the great benefits of Jones Act is it does provide clear rules and stability to a lot of these core markets. I know in our, in our economies, in Alaska and Hawaii in particular, that are such remote economies, the Jones Act provides reliable stability of container ship uh, supply, which really helps those economies from an overall planning perspective and reduces costs um, in general. So I think, I think the stability piece of it lowers cost of capital, no question about it. And in our case, we believe it's important to be an investment grade company. We have an investment grade balance sheet. So we've got ready access to all, all sorts of debt capital, but we're, I wouldn't say that, you know, we are definitely not a thinly equitized company. We're a pretty solidly equitized company as well. So to me, it's more investors uh, aren't just Jones Act investors or otherwise. They're looking for 
the best risk adjusted uh, returns on their investments. And they'll evaluate Jones Act investments across the spectrum of other things they can invest in um, and without a bias one way or other, other than just seeking the best returns they can. Joel, okay. to, uh, to throw you a bone here, Joel, what was the interest rate on that last loan that you did? That Our last loan was 1.3% 1, 1. for 25 year money. So oh. the, the, the capital is there. Before anybody else have any comments, I want to turn uh, before we run out of time here to you know, what you see coming in the next few years. Uh, anyone have any further comments on financing? Just just one comment on, on accessing debt capital. And as a private company, obviously that's uh, an important source of, of external capital when we go to uh, raise funds. Um, we, we've, we're certainly not investment grade. We're not hopefully too far off, but um, we've had plenty of interest um, from, from banks and, and various uh, debt sources over the years. Uh, obviously, there's the commercial bank uh, market, insurance companies. Uh, there are the uh, Title XI uh, government guarantee uh, bonds and, and, and financing program that's available through MERAD in the Department of Transportation. Uh, U.S. private placement uh, plays an important role, and of course, equipment lessors as well. So, uh, I think access to capital and, and debt capital is 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 not really an issue, and I don't believe the Jones Act itself is, is the, the main driver, as Joel pointed out. I think really it's all about the more traditional credit considerations that uh, any borrower would face when you're, when you're going to market for, for raising, raising funds. Uh, turning talk about Zach uh, um, for a moment at least, uh, whether it's, it's, it's safe for now or is likely to be repealed or amended. Uh, one of the potential amendments is to include Puerto Rico among the U.S. territories that are excluded from the Jones Act. And there are even some discussion, uh, Joel, about excluding Hawaii. Um, what do you think you see coming politically in the Jones Act, especially with U.S. presidential elections coming up uh, in the uh, next month? Yes, uh, I, I can tell you in the case of the Hawaii delegation, there's very, very strong support, and there always has been. Um, and there's been recent studies showing that Jones Act is helpful to the Hawaiian economy. Uh, there's a recent study looking at a basket of a very significant number of consumer, consumable items and what do they cost to purchase in Hawaii versus California, and there was no discernible difference. So the stability and the reliability of the Jones Act is, is absolutely critical, and that's well understood and supported in the Hawaii market. So. I don't think there's an issue there in terms of support and broadly, I, I'll, I'll offer my colleagues to all speak as well, but we, we view the Jones Act as in solid support uh, on both sides of the aisle um, in DC and we, we feel good about that support continuing. Okay. Um, I, go ahead, go ahead, go ahead David. Right. Um, I don't know whether you saw the Trade Winds article, I think it was just out today or yesterday, but it's, it shows both Biden and Trump is strongly supporting the Jones Act. So oh, that's uh, good. I know we've I know we've got the uh, presidential elections, but they both have stated unequivocally that they're in support of the Jones Act. And I would say even back when there was an attempt back in the John McCain era, when he brought uh, when McConnell opened the Senate back up for the first time, uh, you know, in that era to to do the business of the Senate. Uh, McCain offered a an amendment to another bill to address the Jones Act, and I think only six senators sided with him. So, you know, there's pretty broad support, both bipartisan support for the Jones Act. Uh, any, anyone else want to toss something in? Uh, Dan uh, Warner, Dan Thorogood. Sure. sure. Um, and, uh, Totally agree with the, the, the previous comments. Uh, we, we see very little risk to, to the Jones Act being eroded uh, with regards to our operations in, in Puerto Rico, since that was mentioned. Uh, you know, Crowley too has invested considerable amounts of money um, to modernize its fleet, to provide reliable, safe, uh, emission compliant uh, vessels uh, dedicated solely to the Puerto Rico US mainland trade. Uh, so to have regulations change that would Promote that uh, investment, um, not to mention some of the other competitors in the trade lane, uh, it seems a little uh, illogical. Uh, and again, uh, our read on the presidential outcome is that you know both administrations seem to be very supportive of the Jones Act um, at this time. 
Good. Let me, let me turn a little bit to um, where we're we going next. Uh, thinking about working from home and social distancing in the age of COVID-19 uh, and uh, the, the state of the economy, how is that going to affect your businesses and your employees going forward? Does anyone want to try that one? <laughs> uh, this, is, this is Sam. Uh, maybe I can take that one first. Um, you know, broadly speaking, OSG has, has not skipped a beat working from home. Um, you know, to, I, I say to people oftentimes, you know, we have 24 vessels that operate remotely all the time. So as an organization, we're accustomed to sort of remote operations and how to set up communication and work processes to, uh, to allow for teams to work together uh, that aren't sitting across from each other. Um, I, I, I'm a big believer that, um, you know, work from home is going to be a big part of the future. Uh, I don't, I don't see uh, for OSG a situation where everybody works from home all the time. Uh, but I think that the last eight, 10 months have, uh, have proven that there's a, there's a large degree of uh, credibility in allowing people to have much more flexibility in the way they choose to work and where they choose to work from. And uh, I think that's going to be a permanent feature of our office environment going forward. Just to, to wind up, because I'd like to give the uh, audience a chance to ask questions. I think we've, I've been monitoring the questions. I think we've got most of them covered. But um, uh, let me ask this. Where do you see the Jones Act, uh, your companies in the Jones Act going in the next 10 years or so? Um, for example, uh, you know, there's been a flurry of activity around U.S. offshore wind power uh, and the uh, a bill was introduced and approved by uh, the U.S. House of Representatives, so it still needs to go to the Senate and be signed into law, called the Clean Energy and Jobs Innovation Act. Um, that would extend, um, would clarify, I think it would make it, make it, it would extend the, the, the Jones Act to wind towers and uh, uh, electric supply, uh, electric service platforms uh, that work with them or connected to them uh, would extend the Jones Act to those kinds of installations because as currently worded, it, it's uh, somewhat doubtful, I think, that uh, the Outer Sh Continental Shelf Lands Act would apply to, uh, um, to uh, offshore wind, uh, in, although most developers, I think, to, to avoid any question about it or trying to comply with the Jones Act in, in building and maintaining uh, uh, offshore wind power. Do you, any of you see, what, what's, are, you, are any of you looking to get into that sector or any others uh, uh, that are Jones Act related? Uh, John, this is Dan. Uh, yes, we, we are looking hard at, at uh, wind farm installation uh, and we do expect it to remain under uh, Jones Act jurisdiction. And uh, that's the way we're planning on going forward. Um, I think, uh, you know, will the bill proceed? Uh, I think it depends. I think it will eventually. Uh, I think it will go a little faster if Biden wins and maybe a little slower if Trump wins. Uh, but by and large, I think that that is the future and, and we expect that to remain um, a Jones Act um, sector in the future. Um, let's see. Uh, John, maybe I can chime in with some thoughts on the future. Uh, my, my own view is uh, looking at the tanker sector, the ATB sector and the Jones Act, the fleet is relatively modern and Jones Act vessels tend to uh, have a little bit longer life uh, uh, from, from a customer acceptability than foreign vessels. So I think the principal challenge for uh, our company and others that are in the sector is how to transition to the, in, in the global d dialogue is about what's the next generation of engines and fuels and how do you then invest in that capital and technology to be able to uh, meet a goal zero by two 2050. Um, you know, I, I think that the Jones Act investment uh, is, is going to be caught in an awkward uh, time period between maybe the transitional LNG and other type fuels and whatever comes next, which is not really understood at this stage. And uh, that, that has to be an area of, uh, of thought provoking uh, concern for for me and from for my colleagues in terms of how, how do we look at the next generation of assets in our in our fleet? Well, I'm I'm afraid we're out of time. Uh, I had a uh, many more questions to ask, but uh, I wanted to uh, mention that uh, after the conference, after this panel, the uh, uh, panelists will be available in the Capital Link chat room to discuss any questions you have or any questions that we didn't answer. 
but please let me uh, thank the panelists for joining the conference and uh, uh, thank Capital Link for this wonderful opportunity to connect uh, with these very um, knowledgeable uh, executives and analysts in the, uh, in the Jones Act space. Uh, thank you very much. Well, thank, thank, you for me, uh, thank you for me as well. It's been a great panel. I have to say I'm, I'm particularly proud that we got everybody who comes in this business to be on this panel. Thank you so much. It's been very insightful. Uh, and again, thank you very, very much. Thank you, John. Thank you, Ben. Thank you to each one of you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Pleasure to be here. Okay. Thank you. Take care, guys.